St. John the Almoner, taken from The Lives of the Fathers of the Eastern Desert, written by the Right Reverend Bishop Richard Chandler, Bishop of Deborah, most famous for his revision of the Dewey Rames translation of the Bible. The following on St. John the Almoner was taken from his life, written by Leonincius, his contemporary, Bishop of Nepolis in Cyprus. This saint, whose life has been commonly published with those of the fathers of the desert, though it does not appear that he ever lived in the desert, was born at Cyprus about the year 552, his father, Epiphanius, being at that time governor of the island. He was brought up from his childhood in Christian piety, and among other virtues, he was always in particular manner addicted to alms deeds and to the works of mercy and charity to the poor, from whence he was ever since been distinguished by the surname of the almoner or almsgiver. He was confirmed in the love and practice of this heavenly virtue by a vision he had in his youth, which himself afterwards related in the following manner. When I lived in the island of Cyprus, being then no more than fifteen years old, I saw one night in a dream a young virgin crowned with olive of an incomparable beauty, and more bright than the sun, who, standing by my bed, struck me on the side and awaked me. Being at length awake, I still perceived her standing in the same spot, and supposed her to be a woman. Wherefore, making the sign of the cross, I asked who she was, and how she could have the boldness to come to my bedside whilst I was asleep. She answered with a sweet and smiling countenance, I am the eldest daughter of the great celestial king. Take me for thy friend, and I will conduct thee into his presence, for no one has so much power and interest with him as I have, since it was I that even brought him down from heaven to earth, and made him become man, in order to save man. Having said these words, she instantly disappeared. As soon as I recovered from my surprise, I began to think that this heavenly beauty represented alms deeds and mercy and compassion for the afflicted, because it was indeed the mercy, compassion, and goodness of God towards mankind that made him come down from heaven to clothe himself in our humanity. Having arisen, I immediately dressed myself, and without awaking any of the family, went at the first dawning of the day to the church, in my way I met a poor man trembling with cold, and in order to make, as it were, an experiment of the truth of the vision, I pulled off my cloak and gave it to him. Presently after, before I had reached the church door, a stranger, clothed in white, came up and put a purse into my hands, containing a hundred pieces of money, saying, Take this, my brother, and distribute it as you think fit. The joy, together with the surprise in which I then found myself, induced me to receive the purse without demur. But then, upon reflection, I turned back to follow the person, and to return to him his money, as having no want or occasion for it, he vanished out of my sight. From that day I often gave alms to my brethren the poor, saying within myself, Now I shall see whether Jesus Christ, according to his promise, will return me a hundredfold by which I became guilty of a great sin in tempting God, and afterwards conceived a great remorse of conscience for it. Yet I still received from him, at sundry times, and at diverse manners, all the satisfaction I came to desire. End quote. So far the saint speaking of his younger days. St. John had given the most brilliant examples of all virtues, more especially of an unbounded charity and a secular life, till about the fifty-fourth year of his age, when the great reputation of his sanctity, which now spread itself far and near, recommended him so strongly to the church of Alexandria that upon the death of Theodore, its patriarch, he was chosen as his successor. The emperor Heraclius, in the meantime, using his utmost influence to overcome the repugnance the saint had to this promotion, of which he thought himself infinitely unworthy. As soon as he arrived at Alexandria, he sent for the archdeacon and officers of the church and said to them, It would be unjust, O my brethren, if we should begin with any other care or concern before that which we owe to Jesus Christ. Wherefore, be pleased to go through the city and let me have an exact list of all my masters. As they seemed to not understand his meaning, he explained himself, saying that he considered the poor not only as his lords and masters, but as coadjutors also, who, by their prayers, were to help him to heaven. The list of the poor which they brought in found to amount, in that great and populous city, 
to upwards of seven thousand five hundred. Yet notwithstanding their being so numerous, the saint gave orders that a daily allowance of necessaries should be given to every one of them out of his revenue. After his consecration, he immediately applied himself with all diligence and fervor to execute every branch of his pastoral charge with the utmost perfection, and, as a true father of his people, to procure them whatever was either for their spiritual or corporal welfare. He began by putting an effectual stop to the frauds and injustices committed in trade, particularly by false weights and measures, a practice which, said he, God, as we learn from his divine word, utterly abhors. And as he was informed that they who had the administration of the temporalities of his church were often biased by presents which were made them so as to be partial in their discharge of their office, he sent for them, and after appointing them a larger salary, strictly forbid them to receive any presents from any person whatsoever. Because, said he, a fire shall consume the house is of those that take bribes. Being also informed that many who labored under injuries and oppressions were intimidated by his secretaries and officers from laying their complaints before him, as a remedy to so great an evil, he ordered a chair to be placed before the great church, with a bench on each side, which where he attended for several hours every Wednesday and Saturday to give audience, and redress the grievances of all that pleased to come for that purpose, and would charge the proper officer to see that which he ordered should be presently executed. Upon which occasion he used to say, If we poor mortals are allowed at every hour to enter the house of God, in order to address our supplications to him, and lay all our wants before him, through his majesty be incomprehensible, and infinitely elevated above all created things. If we, continues he, are so anxious that he would hear our prayers, and make haste to help us, how ready ought we to be to hear the petitions, and grant the just demands of our fellow servants, remembering that saying of our Lord Jesus, With what measure you have measured, it shall be measured to you again. Matthew chapter 7 verse 2 on these occasions it was the custom of our saint who hated idleness either to employ his time in reading the holy scriptures whilst he was waiting in order to give audience to such as should apply to him or in spiritual conferences with some servants of god but one day having remained there till noon without being applied to by any one he withdrew with tears in his eyes saying that none of his people had favored him that day, or afforded him any opportunity of offering something to Jesus Christ, in order to cancel his own innumerable sins. Sophronius, a great servant of God, who sat by him, replied that he ought rather to rejoice to find that God had made him the instrument in establishing so good a harmony and perfect a peace amongst the sheep committed to his charge, that there was not even one to be found amongst them that had any difference or misunderstanding with his neighbor, for this indeed, said he, is converting men into angels. This Sophronius, with John and his companion, men equally eminent both for their wisdom and their sanctity, were sent by divine providence to the assistance of our saint. He made use of them upon all occasions, as his counselors and directors, and obeyed them with as much submission as if they had been his fathers, and his esteem, as well as his love for them, were the more increased by the success that attended the exertion of their eminent talents in bringing back to God innumerable souls who had been unhappily seduced by the Ectatian heresy, which then greatly prevailed all over Egypt, even amongst many of the religious. By means of these holy men, the saint had the comfort of beholding in his days not only many private houses and families, but also several churches and monasteries delivered out of the jaws of the infernal wolf, and again restored to the true fold of Christ, the Catholic Church. As to our saint, he incessantly warned his flock to avoid all communion in spirituals with any who were separated by heresy from the communion of the church and not so much as to enter into their churches or meeting-houses, much less to join them in prayer, even though any one should be so unhappily circumstanced as to be confined during his whole life to a place where he could never see a Catholic priest, or receive any of the holy sacraments. For, said he, as the laws of God and man forbid any one, who has a wife living, to cohabit with another woman, how distant, or for how long, soever his lawful wife may be separated from him, 
So he who has been espoused to Christ in the Catholic Church cannot, without the crime of spiritual adultery, upon any pretext whatsoever, engage himself in the communion of heretics. Exclusive of the assistance that our saint received in the discharge of his pastoral office from those two great men, he was also desirous of participating in prayers and merits of the holy solitaries, for whose manner of life, though he had never been a solitary himself, he conceived the utmost esteem. To this end, having assembled together a number of saint-like anchorets out of the desert, he distributed them into two bands, and built cells for them in two chapels, erected at his own charges, the one dedicated to the Blessed Virgin, the other to St. John, furnishing them with all necessaries out of his own farms, in order, as he told them, that whilst he, under God, took upon himself the care of providing for their corporal sustenance, they, on their part, should provide for the spiritual necessities of his soul, especially by offering up to God in his behalf their evening and midnight devotions. These foundations of our saints were of great edification to the faithful of Alexandria, many of whom, in different parts of the city, were excited by the example of these holy men to pass whole nights in singing the praises of God. It would be an endless task to relate the particulars of all the great things done by our saint during his ten years of his Episcopal administration, as well for the promoting of the glory of God, as for the sanctification and salvation of the souls committed to his charge, together with the many wonderful examples he gave of humility, meekness, patience, charity for all, even his enemies, and the rest of the evangelical virtues, but as the most distinctive traits in his character were the most tender compassion for the poor and distress, and an unbounded liberality in the point of alms deeds, we cannot refrain from adducing the following extraordinary instances. In his time, Koros, king of Persia, having laid waste to Syria and other parts of the Eastern Empire, and carried off a greater number of Christians into captivity and slavery, such as could escape his hands, made their best of their way to Alexandria, and presented themselves in great multitude to the man of God as the known refuge of all the distressed. The saint received them all with open arms, and as many of them were sick and wounded, he placed in hospitals or other lodgings, where they were all entertained at his charges, and as long as they themselves chose to remain, the most tender care was taken of them. And as to the rest, who were innumerable, he ordered his almoners to give a piece of silver to every man that applied to them for charity, and two to every woman or girl, in consideration of the weakness of their sex. His almoners, perceiving amongst the greater number of those that applied for relief, soon to be richly clad, made a scruple of giving them any money, and came to consult the saint on the subject. But he, being highly displeased at their not having complied to the letter with those words of our Lord in Luke chapter 6 verse 30, Give to every one that asketh of thee, desired that they would not in the future be so inquisitive into the circumstances of those who came to give alms, but rather distribute that which belonged to God with a bountiful hand, according to the will and commandment of Christ. But if your little faith, said he, make you apprehend it, lest my income should not be sufficient to furnish wherewith to relieve such great numbers, I will by no means become a partaker in your unbelief. For since it has pleased God to make me, though most unworthy, the dispenser of his goods, if all the men in the world were to come to Alexandria to crave alms, I would relieve them, under an entire confidence that they would never be able to exhaust his immense stores, nor those of the church." Whilst this great multitude of strangers remained at Alexandria, one of them, in order to put the saint's extreme charity and compassion for the distress to a trial, presented himself in a ragged garment one day when the man of God was going to the hospital to visit the sick, which he constantly did twice or thrice in a week, and begged he would have pity on a poor captive and order him some relief. The saint immediately ordered his almoner to give him six pieces of silver. No sooner had he received the alms, but he departed, and having changed his dress, and met the saint again in another street, he cast himself at his feet, saying he was a poor man in the utmost distress, and begged his assistance. The holy prelate then told his almoner to give him six pieces of gold, although his officer had just whispered in his ears, and told him that it was the very same person who had relieved a little before. 
Again, he came a third time, still imploring the charity of the man of God, and when the almoner signified that it was the same identical person, the saint answered, Give him twelve pieces of gold. For possibly, said he, This may be Jesus Christ, my Savior, who has come on the purpose to try me, alluding in all probability to what had happened not long before to St. Gregory the Great. In the meantime, the Persians, continuing their devastations in the eastern provinces, drove still greater numbers of people to Alexandria to shelter themselves under the charitable wings of our saint, who, not content with relieving all that came, sent also considerable alms to Modestus, the patriarch of Jerusalem at this time, reduced to the great extremity with all his people by the Persians, who had taken the city and burnt the churches." With his alms, he also sent a letter to the patriarch apologizing for not sending something more worthy of the temple of God, and declaring how glad he should be if circumstances would permit him to come himself in person, and labor with his own hands in rebuilding the holy church of the sepulcher and resurrection of our Lord, requesting also that he would excuse his want of the means and obtain for him by his prayers that his name might be written in the book of life. At this time, the innumerable multitude of persons that came from all parts to Alexandria made all sorts of provisions exceedingly dear, more especially as the harvest hath failed in Egypt, the Nile not having overflowed that year as usual. The saint, who could not endure to see distress, laid out all the money he had or could in any way procure, either by begging or borrowing of good people, till at length, all being spent, no one could be found that would lend him any more. Everybody apprehending lest by the continuance of the famine they should come themselves to want. When, behold, amidst these extremities, as if God had a mind to try the fidelity of his servants, a rich citizen, who was desirous of being promoted to holy orders, but was prevented by the canons of the church, on account of his having been twice married, made him an offer of two hundred thousand bushels of wheat which he had stored up, together with a very large sum of money to be disposed of in charities, upon the condition he would dispense with the irregularity he had incurred by his bigamy and ordain him deacon. The saint told him that although the offering which he proposed could never come at a time in which it was more wanted, he nevertheless could not accept it, as it was defective and tainted by the condition which it was annexed, because the law of God required the sacrifice offered to him should be clean and without blemish, and as to the present necessities of his brethren, the poor, as well as those of the church, he was confident that the same divine goodness which had hitherto taken care of them would still continue to feed and support them, provided, said he, he was inviolably observe what he commands us. No sooner had he returned this answer and dismissed the ambitious aspirer to a spiritual promotion but his people brought him the gladsome tidings that the two great ships belonging to the church, which he had sent to Sicily, were just arrived at the port laden with corn, upon which the man of God prostrated himself on the ground, and returned hearty thanks to our Lord, who had not only preserved him from the sin under that trial, but had immediately sent him such a seasonable and abundant provision. Mm -hmm.